Hey, we're going to do something a little bit different today because I'm indoors. Uh, yeah, it gets dark at like 4 o'clock this time of year. It's cold out there and I don't have any work to do out there right now. So we're going to talk about stuff indoors. Uh, today I want to talk about electric pickup trucks. And that's a topic that I know has a ton of politics and opinions and wackadoo stuff about it. I don't want to talk about any of that stuff. I want to talk about just putting the hardware to work. And I'm not for or against electric vehicles. I don't really have an opinion either way. There's probably some things they're good at. There's probably some stuff they're not good at. And that's going to get worked out by the market. I just want to talk about putting the hardware to work today. And specifically with EV pickup trucks, as you probably figure, there's like a demographic of people who are going to buy EV trucks right now. And that's cool. Nothing against them at all. But that demographic isn't the majority, right? Like they're going to run out of that people. They're going to buy all the pickup trucks they're going to buy. And then they're going to have to start trying to sell EV pickup trucks to dudes like me. And um, it's not that they can't. I'm not anti-EV. So what do I mean by dudes like me? Uh, well, I grew up farming. I grew up on a working farm. We were small enough that we didn't have any employees, but we were big enough that it was our only source of income. And that meant that we had to put everything we had to work, whatever it was. It had to do the job, right? Trucks weren't fashion accessories. In addition to that, I've been a lifelong outdoorsman. And just like anybody else with a sore back and strong hands, I'm not unique. There's nothing special about me. One thing that we have all done, every last one of the people that lived this life, We've all hooked up a chain to the back of the pickup truck, and we've asked something that didn't want to move to move, right? We've all tried to pull a stump out of somewhere. We've all tried to pull over a barn that was too dangerous to chop down from inside. We've all tried to get something stuck unstuck. We've all tried to pull start a tractor with a dead starting battery. Those are all things you're going to do with a pickup truck because that's why you own the tool. And that's a problem with EV pickup trucks because EV pickup trucks have this reputation of having all the torque in the world, and they don't. That thumbnail isn't clickbait. Now, I know the common attitude is that electric motors make all the torque, right? But this has an electric motor here, and you could probably figure that this doesn't make all the torque, right? It makes the amount that it's designed to make. Uh, a Cummins diesel engine for a regular, like, you know, half ton to three quarter ton truck, uh, it makes a thousand foot pounds of torque at the crankshaft. And so when you look at EVs and they advertise that they have like 11,000, 12,000, whatever foot pounds of torque, you might think, wow, that's like 10 times as much but they're not being really all that honest there because the torque that a Cummins diesel engine makes, 1,000 foot-pounds, it does that at the crankshaft before it goes through the transmission, before it goes to the transfer case, before it goes to the differential gears. It's quite a bit more by the time it gets through all those things. It's actually a little bit difficult to find published figures for modern EV trucks for both the rotor torque and also the torque at the wheels. I asked a large language model repeatedly for the torque at the wheels of an F-150 Lightning EV and it kept on insisting it had 775 foot-pounds of torque at the wheels, uh, which I don't think that's quite accurate because something else that has more than 775 foot-pounds of torque at the wheels is this rotor tiller. Seriously, it's got about a 2500 RPM operating speed for the engine, a walking speed of about 1.7 miles per hour. That gives us roughly a 90 to 1 gear reduction in the gearbox, and that means with about 9, 9.5 foot-pounds of torque from this motor, we're at somewhere around 800 plus foot-pounds of torque at the wheels on this rototiller. Now we know that an F-150 Lightning EV makes more than that, so that means that that quoted number 775 is definitely at the rotor, not at the wheels. Thankfully with the Rivian, which is a comparable truck, and I think all the EV trucks are kind of in the same general ballpark as each other, I was able to get some real numbers from them. So they quote 908 foot-pounds of torque for the total combined system, and they quote 14,000 newton meters of torque at the wheels. Now 14,000 newton meters works out to about 10,300 foot-pounds of torque in the units that I'm used to working with, and they're even kind enough to point out that it's about a 54% bias to the rear, which means that we're somewhere around 5,575 foot-pounds of torque that it can deliver to the two rear wheels combined. Now the Rivian quad motor EV doesn't have any connection between any of its wheels, meaning that the motor for the left rear wheel is only the motor for the left rear wheel. It doesn't connect to any of the other wheels. And that presents a bit of a challenge for those EV vehicles. Uh, none of them have a drive shaft between the front and the rear, which means that when you're asking it for maximum torque, if your front wheels are being lifted off the ground by the load you're applying to the rear of it, the front wheels might start slipping, but they can't contribute any of their spare power to the rear wheels, which means that the rear wheels of a Rivian truck are never going to be able to make more than 5,575 foot-pounds together when they're pulling. That's less than a 1998 Kia Sportage. 
I'm being serious. But, now there's nothing special about a Kia Sportage, by the way. That's just a random little kind of four-cylinder pretend SUV that I Googled up. And if you're an expert on the Sportage and I got some of these numbers wrong, I apologize. I just Googled them and they, they seem pretty much like they're appropriate. Uh, if I'm wrong though, I, I think the numbers are going to be close enough. So a 1998 Kia Sportage has a four-cylinder gasoline engine that's good for 129 foot-pounds of torque. And that goes into the transmission's first gear, which is a ratio of 3.72 to 1, which means the output shaft of the transmission is spinning about 27% as fast, but makes 372% as much torque as it did on the way in. That force then enters the transfer case, which again trades speed for torque in the form of a 2.48 to 1 low-range gear reduction. That then gets handed off to the front rear axles, where it goes through another stage of reduction by 4.78 to 1, by which time that 129 foot-pounds of torque at the engine is 5,689 foot-pounds of torque at the wheels, which is more than 5,575 that a Rivian R1T can do. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that nobody is cross-shopping a quarter century old Kia with a brand new EV truck. I just wanted to use kind of an extreme example to you know, get us on the same page about why this actually matters. They're most likely going to compare it with a conventional gasoline or diesel powered half ton pickup truck because that's the class of vehicle it's in. As luck would have it, I have a gasoline powered half ton pickup truck. It's a few years old at this point, so a newer one's going to be even better in every factor here. But we'll go ahead and work with mine just to get ourselves kind of more calibrated to what the problem is and what the solution might be. So mine's got a V8 engine that's good for 410 foot-pounds of torque at the crank. That goes through a torque converter into the first gear. First gear in the transmission is 3 to 1 because it's an RFE transmission. And then that goes to a transfer case with a 2.64 to 1 low range reduction. And that goes to the front rear axles which have 3.55 to 1 differential gears in them and a limited slip in the rear axle. The limited slip is biased by the brake traction control system, so it becomes really indistinguishable from a locker. I know it's not a really real locker, but with the brake traction control in addition to the clutches inside the rear limited slip, it's able to deliver pretty much all that power to one rear wheel or the other if it has to. So what does that add up to? That adds up to like 11,500 and change foot-pounds of torque at the rear wheels at potentially one rear wheel which is about four times as much as what a Rivian can deliver to one rear wheel, or twice what it can deliver to two rear wheels. And it's slightly more than a Rivian can deliver to all its wheels, right? Because 11,500 is like more than 1,000 more than 10,300. Another part I didn't even mention is that torque converters are actually able to produce more output torque than input torque. When you're overrunning a torque converter, the output is one and a half to two and a half times as much, which means that we can kind of double the amount. We're doing like close to 20,000 foot-pounds of torque from my conventional, now kind of old gas-powered pickup truck. The last part I want to say about that is that a lot of people will argue, well, an EV makes all of its torque at zero RPM, and so that obliterates a gas engine. Just check out any drag race, right? And that's kind of right, but also kind of wrong and a little bit meaningless. Uh, first thing, tree stumps don't have stopwatches. We're not talking about drag races. Yes, an EV will obliterate almost any gas engine in a drag race because the gas engine has to run through a torque converter first. A torque converter, however, has lived between gas engines and transmissions for decades at this point, and its job is to let the engine make all its torque while the wheels are going zero RPM. That's kind of its deal. And so when we're talking about delivering torque to the ground, instantaneous torque actually doesn't matter because the tree stump is going to be there two seconds from now. If you're talking about winning a drag race, yeah, that, that first half second absolutely matters. Show me any drag race in the world, the EV's going to win. We've, you know, it's, it's a one-trick pony. Yeah, I, I get it. Your EV wins drag races. Um, okay, I can still get on the freeway just fine. I'm not really worried about that. When it comes to pulling a static object, like a stuck vehicle or a stump or something like that, that first half second is kind of of no consequence, it's, it just doesn't matter. So where exactly does that leave us? Uh, well, this isn't something insurmountable. This is something that the EV manufacturers absolutely can incorporate into their heavier vehicles. And I'm not talking about commuter cars. They're already just fine. I'm talking about trucks that they want people to do work with, right? Uh, the three ways I could see them doing this, uh, one of them is they could just simply do a deeper gear reduction. I don't see them doing that because that means they have to speed up the rotor a lot more. And that has some serious safety implications because the inertia increases at a much higher rate than just the linear speed increase. And what that means is that when they're trying to speed up and slow down that rotor for regen and for traction control and torque vectoring, 
it's going to be a lot slower to react and may actually lead to wheel slippage in the worst conditions. So I don't think they're going to do it that way. They're probably already pushing the limits pretty far in that respect. The second way they could do it is with a differential input transmission. I'm talking about something similar to what a Prius has in it, except replace the gas engine with a high torque, relatively low speed motor, and then have a high speed, relatively low torque motor on the other side of it. With those two inputs, they could take a brake, like a mechanical brake disc, and actually stop the secondary motor, the high speed, low torque motor, and then use the big, low speed, high torque motor as your drive motor when you're doing something that requires a lot of torque. I think that would be the smoothest, it would be completely seamless because they could just speed up and slow down the two motors on the differential input at will. However, that would be the heaviest and most expensive and that's why they probably wouldn't do it that way. And the third way they could do it is just by implementing a selectable transmission, like just having a low range set of gears that you can select into when you want to go and do heavy duty work. Uh, now another thing they could kind of sort of do in between those two things is they could run a jack shaft at motor speed between the front and rear axles with a selectable clutch on it at both ends so that it's not contributing to inertia during normal running, but during you know maneuvers that require a lot of torque, they can connect the front and rear drive units together and share power among the two of them. I think that would be like the lowest cost, easiest way to do it. It wouldn't be the greatest, but that's the one I expect that probably would get implemented the most if they were going to implement anything like this. It's a possibility that these companies are not actually trying to court people like me. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have to build a vehicle for guys like me, uh, but I suspect they probably are at least trying. As an example, Ram makes something called the Ram Charger. It's an upcoming EV that has a range extender gasoline motor on it. The gasoline motor doesn't connect to the wheels in any way. It just simply powers a generator, which then powers the EV powertrain, right? And so it still has the limitations of all the stuff we just got done talking here. I haven't actually seen what its facts and figures are in terms of torque at the wheels. The unique thing about that versus other EV vehicles on the market is it's a big enough motor that it can tow at full capacity even with a flat battery and some clever battery management tricks. I think it's actually a really promising build. It's something that completely eliminates the idea of range anxiety because you never actually have to plug it in. You could just keep pouring gasoline into the thing but you could also plug it in and save a lot of money on your fueling when you're just doing around town trips and stuff like that, especially if you don't live too far out in the sticks. You may never actually have to start the motor in a year. So that means you're filling up on gas one or two times a year, you know, or whatever, not a big deal. Um, so I think they probably are trying to court people who aren't the current EV buyers with something that EV buyers would still buy. And I think they're gonna have to figure out this pulling on stuff thing before they get widespread acceptance. Anyway, let me know what you think down below and also let me know what you think of this format because I got this uh, desk on Marketplace for 20 bucks and I got to put it to work. Thanks for watching.